I now uh, wish to call on Professor Alex Mintz, Chairman of the Institute for Policy and Strategy and outgoing Dean of the Lauder School of Government, who will speak in memory of his student, Stephen Sotloff. As the Dean of the Lauder School of Government, when uh, Steve studied and graduated from, and as his instructor in a class on foreign policy decision making in fall 2007, I would like to share with you what IDC professors say about Steve. Dr. Alisa Pellet, the head of the Argov program, she observed that Steve was a student no professor can forget. He was a student of the world. Steve worried that time was running out, pointing out that extremism was rising in the region and the Arab society is a pressure cooker waiting to boil over. Professor Galia Golan, the former head of the diplomacy division at the school, observed that and said that I knew Steve better than other students because while he was taking my class, he went to Lebanon as a journalist and we spoke about it before and after his trip there. He was really a very serious and dedicated journalist. Not dramatic, not Schwitzer in her words, just dedicated. IDC Vice President Jonathan Davis remembers then when he interviewed Steve for the first time in New York City for his candidacy for the Lauder School of Government RRIS English track. He found him as a genuinely nice fellow, wanted to widen his horizons, and had the real passion and desire to learn as much as possible about the Middle East. And as the dean of the school, I remember Steve and as extremely curious individual wanted to learn and know more about the Middle East, the people, the cultures, its politics, its rivalries and competitions in the region, and prospects for peace, change, and radicalism. Steve was eager to learn about strategies and strategic trends and diplomatic moves and counter moves in the region. He often missed classes, and we had to meet and, and talk during office hours because of his travel in the region. So it's very specially individual and a very student, student who will all miss. Steve Sotloff studied the clash of civilization, a famous theory in international relations, and was sadly killed in a clash within a civilization in a cruel and brutal way. He is a baruch. I just want to mention in Hebrew, uh, Professor Reichman is scared at Shloshet Abogrim Shela Ben Tchumish in a floor Betsuk Eitan. He carte it itev at Safrir Shelano, Zechrono Livracha, Samgad Guda Siur Shel Golani. At Sari Loi carte it Amots Bedolev Zal. A Hiucha Mevia Shel Safrir Loi Ozeli Merosh. Halom Shel Bachur, Talmid Metsuyan. ואשתו סיוון שגם למדה אצלנו בממשל בבין תחומי, הם הכירו כאן ולמדו כאן, היא גיבורה, ואנחנו בבין תחומי לא נשכח את ספריר אמוץ ודולב היקרים. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, and ambassadors and distinguished guests, His Excellency Daniel Shapiro, U.S. Ambassador to Israel, the Honorable Matthew King, Deputy Secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security, Lieutenant Colonel John Kenko, United States Army Fellow at the ICT, Professor Uri Reichman, President and Founder of the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya, Mr. Shabtai Shavit, former Director of the Israeli Mossad and Chairman of the ICT, Dr. Boaz Ganor, founder and executive director of the ICT and the dean of the latter's tool of government. My name is Benny Shoulder. 
I was a student here at the IDC and a close friend of Steve Salaf. How do I begin to do what I'm about to do now? How do you give adequate remarks to sum up a life taken from all of us so early, so young, and so tragically? Naturally and fortunately, most of us have probably never had to eulogize one of their best friends. It's truly a horrible concept. I will try my best to share with you all today what I believe that Steve himself would be proud and happy to hear. And that is the version of the day today, Steve, that those of us here fortunate enough to have been acquainted with him knew and loved so much. I first have to say that when I was first approached to recite a few words in front of you today, I thought that I would be speaking in front of a small group of friends, students, and maybe some faculty. And now being someone who doesn't particularly enjoy public speaking, I thought, okay, no problem. However, as the past week progressed, I gradually learned that what was in store for me is I learned about all the distinguished guests that would be here, including the Prime Minister who was here earlier today, uh, and that they'd all be listening to me speak. And for those of you who know Steve's great appreciation of humor and, excuse me for saying this, ball busting, you'll know what I mean when I say that somewhere up there, Steve's handiwork is all over this one for me. So thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> But honestly, Steve was very special from the be very beginning. I, like many of you, first met Steve in 2005 at our orientation here at the IDC. As the first semester began, Steve and I found ourselves going in the same circles of friends, and I quickly found myself happy to see him each and every time we would hang out. Due to our shared background as Olim from the US, and mostly due to Steve's one-of-a-kind, special, zany style of self-depreciating humor. In short, I liked that he was strong enough to laugh at himself and not care what anybody would think he would think about him. He was Steve. He made dirty jokes, was often, uh, it's an understatement, inappropriate, <laughs> wore tie-dyed Pink Floyd t-shirts all the time and everywhere, and knew that he was eating too much junk food, and yet he still didn't care. In short, I knew we were going to be friends. As time progressed, and as we both got more involved in school, we all discovered that underneath Steve's softness and humor was a very intelligent, deeply analytical person. Someone who lived to learn why things are the way they are and to challenge those reasons when they did not add up to him. And someone who yearned to take part in proving to us all that we were wrong when we didn't want to accept that personal change is necessary for the world to evolve into being a better place. Some of us can definitely remember some epic all-nighters where we would eventually all be engaged in some sort of deep philosophical debate with Steve over perhaps the peace process, or religion, or the economy, and Steve could always hold his own. Our friend was a man of, princ a man of principle and convictions, as are so many other strong personalities. It was this conviction which he brought with him to the world of professional journalism, and showing to the world the personal side of our region, the Middle East, which Steve loved so much. In 2007, I left Israel suddenly to return to the U.S. for almost nine months. When I eventually returned, it was Steve who was so excited to see me again. Knowing that I didn't yet have a place to live, he immediately offered me to live together with him in his apartment, even giving me the rooftop room with the best balcony ever. Of everybody I knew at the time, Steve was the only one to accept me back in his life so soon. I will never forget that kindness for as long as I shall live. Another friend of mine, Benjamin Truman, who's here in the audience, who at that time had recently made Aliyah to Israel, had come to Herzliya, and soon we all found ourselves living together in a great apartment for about two years. Cliché aside, those were some of the best years uh, for me in my life. Uh, one would say the prime in a young bachelor's life, and uh, no more explanation will be provided here. Uh, Steve was almost finished with his studies and getting deeper into his writing and to, into journalism. I was learning the ropes in my chosen career in the tourism industry and it felt like we were both invincible. Each day at the end of the day we would return home and Steve, being Steve, would just look at you funny and you would immediately laugh or he'd tell you about his frustrations with Israeli supermarkets or his daily brush with bureaucracy and you'd pretty much just laugh at him and with him. Or sometimes he'd pull some practical joke on you, and uh, that's how he pretty much was all the time. Eventually, the time came for us to go our separate ways. I remember sending Steve off to the airport as he left to return to Miami, where he's from. I was so sad that I was losing a friend, another one moving back to the old country. 
I wished him well, knowing that he was off to regroup and eventually to find himself in some faraway assignment reporting. No less than three hours after Steve uh, left to go to the airport, did we hear a knock on the front door, and Steve was there, walking through the front door with a simple, hey guys, how's it going? As uh, if I didn't just drop him off at the airport three hours earlier. So I said, what happened? And uh, Steve very nonchalantly told us that he wasn't allowed to leave the country because of some outstanding debt to Bituach Lumi. <laughs> All of Steve's friends here know that that's pretty much typical Steve. Eventually, he managed to scrounge together the funds, uh, probably from me, and I guess I'll never be paid back. <laughs> and he paid his bills and was off on his way. In the years that would come, it was, of course, harder to contact Steve, depending on where he was. I progressed with my studies and one day learned that Steve was in Cairo and was present in Tahrir Square covering the Egyptian Revolution and was busy reporting. He had finally caught his break his articles being picked up and regularly printed in Time Magazine, Foreign Policy, and appearing on CNN. I was very, very proud of Steve. Time passed, and he dutifully, and with so much professionalism, would come to report from all the hot spots in the Arab Spring. Libya, Egypt, he br spent a brief time in Yemen, Bahrain, and finally Syria. Steve was very, very smart, and knew Syria was different. Syria, he would say, is the point of no return. Talking to Steve about Syria in the beginning of 2013, he exhibited to me for the first time fear about his efforts to report. I knew that it would be futile to dissuade him from going there, so I instead wished him good health, safety, and luck. He said that he had no choice. Nobody is reporting what I am, he would say, and that he had a responsibility to people in Syria to tell their untold story to the world. He then, as we do now, knew that this was his life's mission, and he believed so much in the power of his pen that he would be willing to put it all on the line for freedom's sake. I would last see my friend over July 16th and 17th of last year at my wedding. Steve, throughout the year, had promised me that no matter where he was at the time, he would be at my wedding, and that he wouldn't miss it for anything. Steve was a man of his word, and he came back to Israel to visit and to be there for me at my wedding. He arrived with little cash, which is typical Steve. So as a gift, he had brought me a bottle of single malt whiskey, which he picked up at the Cairo Duty Free, as well as with an election poster from Mohammed Morsi. <laughs> Best wedding gifts ever. Little did I know that it was to be the last time I would be with my friend. But if you had to pick a last time, boy, did he go out in style. I'll never forget how he was so happy being there, laughing, dancing, and being free. In the days to come, I left for my honeymoon, and Steve left for Turkey to cross the border into Syria. He would be kidnapped after crossing the border on August 4th. Looking back now on a life, on our friendship, I can't really begin to make sense of what happened. What went wrong? Who is to blame? ISIS is a brutal, murderous army of thugs, which right now needs to be eradicated. But even if they are, it won't bring back my friend. What do I make of Steve's short yet deeply meaningful life? Do what you believe in. Live it, love it, and be it. Steve died in pursuit of doing something he deeply believed in, in the value of humanity and of freedom. He is my hero today. In closing, Steve managed to smuggle out some letters from the prison camp where he was being held. In them are some of what are, most, what are perhaps the most poignant thoughts ever written, especially considering that he wrote them when he was surely aware of his own dire circumstances and probable fate. In them, he wrote the following. Please know that I am okay. I love you, miss you, pray for you, and hope to see you soon. If we're not together again, perhaps God will be merciful enough to reunite us in heaven. Love and respect each other. Don't fight over nonsense. Hug each other every day. Eat dinner together. Live your lives to the fullest. Stay positive and patient. God rewards those who are patient. And lastly, everyone has two lives. The second one begins when you realize you have only one. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, family, and distinguished guests, we all need to start on the second one. 
That's the meaning of all this for me. Love is the only thing that is real. I miss my friend. On behalf of Arthur, Shirley, and Lauren Sotloff, and the family, I'd like to thank all those who had Stephen in their thoughts and prayers. I'd like to also express gratitude to those here and around the world who had been working so hard and without rest to try to release Steve. His memory will live on in each and every one of us forever. Thank you. May the uh, four fallen alumni of IDC Herzliya rest in peace. Yehi zichram baruch. We will uh, bring this uh, very inspirational memorial ceremony uh, to a close by hearing the song Hallelujah, performed by Liganor and Osnat Bieber, the lyrics and music by Leonard Cohen.
it all went wrong I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing